Hello and welcome back to the Not So Fit Couple podcast with your hosts, Lucy Davis. I'm Benjamin Holden. I'm so excited for today's podcast. Very, very exciting podcast today. And Don't do that. I've got to open it first. Oh, and we have got Mr. Dr. Mike today, ladies and gentlemen. Our the do- first doctor. Our first doctor. <laughs> welcome to the podcast. <laughs> Thank you very much. A dubious honour. It's uh, a bit, this Here is we are with the big words already. Th- this, <laughs> this has it's been all I have. This has been one that's in the making for for a while now, and a very very exciting one. And this one is coming with some confectionaries as well, isn't it? Yeah, I, I couldn't come on your podcast without bringing yeah. some chocolate. Doc, Dr. Mike is a bit of a a food connoisseur, aren't you? When it comes to the confectionery world, I, I wouldn't like to make that claim, but if you make that claim about me, I will accept it. <laughs> <laughs> so he comes, he comes bearing guests. What have you brought with you today? I have brought. Some, I thought I should bring some. This is like bro chocolate, I think. Mm. Like lint dark sea you salt. Can, you sea can salt. show it to your oh, yeah, camera here and then you can tell them. Lint yeah. dark chocolate sea salt. Solid. Also, a new fangled favourite, which is the Tony's <laughs> Chocolate Lonely Sea Salt Caramel. Very, very big one. Is this not like the Willy Wonka chocolate there? No. Because it, very, it looks very Willy Wonka. It's, it's uh, you know, I think it's on a par. But we also have an exclusive, a world exclusive, perhaps, <laughs> on this podcast, which is the newest Lindor double chocolate flavour. What does that mean? This this is exactly. a new one for me. <laughs> and they're all new, new. This is another new Tony's, <laughs> which is white raspberry popping candy, which I'm pretty excited. Are about. these expensive? These Tony's chocolates. Um, nothing is too expensive for you guys. If oh you, wow! I will, I will you know, bring you, very cute. bring you the finest of the chocolate. But I don't think it's particularly expensive in in the, the chocolate realm. Lint is my chocolate of choice of when I'm stealing chocolates in supermarkets. Is it? Like we discussed yesterday, it's a very easy one to go to. It's very COVID friendly because obviously it's wrapped in the packet. So if you're going to go in, yeah. delve in, scrummage a little bit, and take one, that works very I'm t- well. I'm torn here because obviously, like as a you know, as as a doctor. I approve of being COVID friendly, but also as a doctor, I, I'm not sure like I'm supposed to approve of stealing. As a human being, <laughs> <laughs> not even just a doctor. I suppose. It's, not, it's not my realm. Is this? Would you? Are these in your top five chocolates? Because this I was going to be this was going to be one of my questions to you, Mike. What is your what is your top five chocolate bars? What chocolate bars or top five chocolate? Because mm. I would describe the two things completely. Okay, different. let's go chocolate bars. So top five chocolate bars, um, a double decker pre like two thousand and five. Is like, this is this an order? It. Is that yeah. number five? No, like double decker is my proper favourite, oh, but wow, not that's... anymore because okay. they've changed them. What's changed? I don't. The ch- the shape has changed, and I'm pretty sure that some of the consistency has changed as well. So. The new guard. Yeah, <laughs> yes, <exactly>. new guard. <laughs> um, and um, I mean, I like a crunchy, but that feels like a diet chocolate bar because it's the lowest of the calories. Is it really? What's the calories in there? It's like a hundred and eighty like or something. Really? Know. Well, yeah, just exactly, air. exactly. Um, but I just, I don't, I don't generally go for like a chocolate. I like a boost. Oh, boost, good shot. I love a boost, boost bar. Is excellent. Um, but I tend to just go for chocolate, chocolate rather than like I like pieces rather than bars. Yes. I think. I don't know. My my top five. I've got them written down. Do you want to know what they are? Yeah. And you can tell me what you would rate them out of seven because mm. you've got this scoring system where you rate things out of seven, haven't yeah. you? Where did mm-hmm. you pick that up from? Um, so two of my friends, uh, Ali and Amy, um, brought it to my attention, and basically it's just it's a rating system um, whereby. You can't sit on the fence because there's no 50% number. So you can't just give okay. something five out of 10. Um, and it's not like five rating stuff out of five. Like, so you need an odd number, first of all, but mm-hmm. five isn't enough because you can't give enough of a, a spread of, of reviews. Whereas like 11 and nine are just too close to 10 and a bit weird. So seven is perfect. If you actually think about what all what they all mean, it's incredible because three is bad four is good so you can't you have to commit yeah it's either bad or it's good there's no decimals you can't have three and a half um a lot of people think that you can james smith but um (laughs) you can't and uh so stuff like like four out of seven is good five out of seven is very good six out of seven is excellent seven out of seven is outstanding what you know you don't need any more um things than that okay quick fire i would (laughs) this is this is hard because lucy at this chocolate bar the other day it's my favorite chocolate bar and then she was sick after it. Oh gosh! So, mm. it is so the, I've been really off put. That's mm. very traumatizing. Yeah, it is, and it's it was traumatizing for bar. me. Okay. It's the Yorkie biscuit bar. Oh, 
Oh, Yorkie Raisin and Biscuit is an absolute classic. It's not anymore. <laughs> out, of, out of seven. Uh, I I mean, it's a six, easily. Six, yeah, easy six. great chocolate bar. The Did you witness this episode? We were in, well, so we, we we bought it. I convinced her to buy it. Yeah, I was going to get a Mars bar, which I usually do daily. Okay. We walked to Tesco, and then she was sick in Tesco. She going, Ben, I'm going to be sick. I just went like, why? I don't know if it was the Yorkie, but I, what else could it have been? From the walk to, from the convenience store, 15 minutes later at Tesco, I was like, Ben, I'm going to throw up. I think it was a bit more of a correlation than causation. Anything. Yeah. Okay. Did you um th- and did you w- see her throw it up? I did not. Okay, that's lucky for you. Yeah. So oh no, yeah, I was in a Tesco. Number two, us. caramel whisper gold. No, really? Are you joking? Yeah, and do you know why? I find it too much. I find that the car- just caramel and chocolate like is a bit too much. But back in the day, and I'm talking like proper back in the day, they had a whisper mint, which was basically the equivalent of a whisper gold, but just with a little trace of mint in it, and that was phenomenal. I see, it's um, um, minty chocolate is one well, of those things it. for me where. There's only so many that kind of sit on the side of mm. thumbs up for me. Yeah, I like a Whisper Mint. But um, there's a new Whisper Gold, which has got something else in it, and I can't remember what. Oh, really? I I'll think it might that. be like Honeycomb or something. Oh, mm. stunning. I might have made that up. If I have made that up, and if Whisper are listening, then go for it, because that would be good. <laughs> <laughs> number, number three is Galaxy Cookie. Cookie Combo. Mm. It's the average choice, that then. It's basic. I think I was... I was swayed by Carl's choice on this. Carl, Carl Khan said I was thinking of my top chocolates and he put it in my, in my head so I couldn't forget about it so it was in my list. I like a... I know you like this one as well. The Cadbury's Caramac Bar. Yeah. You I think yours is all shit. I think. Not car- it's you're joking, right? Okay. The, fir- the like first like time I introduced Lucy to Caramac Bar, you walloped, well. she walloped a full pack so quickly that you were sick off no, them like, as well. Yeah. Caramac is nice. It's quite like, sickly, but it's though. It's not really chocolate. Like, I wouldn't kind of go, oh, I feel like having chocolate. I'll go for this chocolate that isn't even actual real like chocolate. I think I'm not a big white chocolate fan. I just I am. I like. I prefer dairy milk to, mm. to Galaxy, to be honest. Mm. Um, I do. Dairy milk, marvellous creations. That is where it's at. I don't think I've tried that. <laughs> oh, it's got I've it's got jelly in it. Yeah, the juxtaposition like of the, the jelly. <laughs> the juxtaposition. The Explain the juxtaposition. So juxtaposition, as we learned from <laughs> from wordsmith Lucy Davis yesterday, and uh, Joe Brighty actually, but is actually a word is when you put two things together that are contrasting. Not yeah. just putting two things together, they have to be contrasting. It has to be contrasting. They have a contrasting outcome. Which your your example was perfect. It was yeah. donuts with gooey sweets, gooey sweets yeah. on, but you just said they're juxtaposed. Yeah. <laughs> but I was like, they're not con- <laughs> <laughs> contrasted. So, yeah, exactly. yeah Dr. Mike uses um, what do you, your cleverness <laughs> as your, <laughs> as your, <laughs> your life, your tool. Um, and we uh, fought that, didn't we? Yeah, I got schooled. <laughs> um, but yeah, so the it's got basically got jelly sweets in it and popping candy, and I think it's got even like shells, like Smarty Shell bits in nice. it as well. Um, so that's really good. Have you tried the Reese's Nut Bar? Very sexy. Yeah, I like it. I love it peanut used butter. Used to be called the Reese's Nut Rageous, which I think was a much better name. Yeah, I agree. Rageous. But. Yeah, it's uh, it's it's up there. That's probably my favourite chocolate bar, actually. Favourite chocolate bar? Yeah, but, you know, these things change all the time. Depends on your I've, mood. I put Mars Bar on there as well, just because it's a bit of an OG. Mars Bar I used to have before every single exam I ever did. So you could, even in a correlation causation situation, say that I owe all of my success to Mars Bars. So your medical degree... Potentially. ...comes down we'll to... Never know. The Mars bar. I, I, for me, the Yorkie's the best one. I think it defines me. I'm, I'm a little bit fruity, but I'm not for girls. I'm already, ta- I'm already taken. Oh, thank you. I think dairy milk, fruit and nut, classic galaxy and chocolate mm. orange. I love fruit and nut, but... I'm a staple, simple girl. So, so that as in Terry's chocolate orange. Terry's chocolate, like orange. chocolate orange. Yeah, yeah. classic, simple. Also Have you tried the Lindor chocolate orange? The yeah. Bar? Yeah. Yes, oh, God, great. we picked that up yeah. in Lidl. And Lidl? I think, generally speaking... I'm a much bigger fan of the Lindor bar than of the um, the truffles. Mm, well, you've got them there. I know, but that's because it's only available in... in I'll give you that. that. What's the new orange one they brought out? The Maltese orange buttons. Have you tried those? Stunning. I haven't tried them yet. They're great. They're really good. Yeah. Let's, let's try one of the chocolates that you brought Which in today. I? I think we should try the pink bar. Yeah. 
Oh, and then a lint ball. A lint lint ball. So we all try and what one's this called? Tony's. This is Tony's Choco Lonely white raspberry popping candy. They look. Ri- I think that looks like quite expensive chocolate, to be honest. It looks very thick. Looks very gare for you. I mean, the problem with this is very difficult to portion because it is. They don't. They don't like separate it into bits. What do you very mean? Much. Oh. It's just like a slab of chocolate. Oh wow, it's a completely different colour than I was thinking. Is it what colour is it? Pink. Yeah. Oh wow. Right. I've taken my piece. Here we go. Hold that up to the camera so we can oh see the colour of it. Oh my god! So, wow. Stunning. Look at that. So it's like a pinky raspberry colour. I'm going in. Wait, move away from the mic. <laughs> that is stunning. Oh my god, are you joking? Mm. <laughs> it's really good. Oh, amazing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, what is that? <gasps> mm. It reminds me if you go to Lake District and you go to like a chocolatier shop, <laughs> that is that. Cal. Oh my god. That is insane. Oh That's so good. What are you going for scores on that? Yeah. I'd give that a. No joke, I'd give that a six. That's a seven for me. Really? Yeah. All out. Yeah. I think you've committed really early. I'm now being left with the white, the, the popping candy. Singles, yeah. That's a seven. Mm. Oh, I wonder if people can hear that. <laughs> <laughs> that is a seven. <laughs> also, guys, if you listen on YouTube, drop your drop your top five chocolate bars in the description right now because we're going to go through and review them. Should we talk uh, about and, and eat at the same time? Okay, yeah. I'm going to go out of there. Oh, my God. Mm-hmm. So one of the things that I spoke to you about, Mike, because obviously you were, you've were you been in the midst of things for the past two years or year and a half during the whole COVID pandemic and seeing things front line. So we're jumping topics here quite quickly. <laughs> from, <laughs> like cho- from, from chocolate to COVID. The I've thrown you, fr- false yeah, <laughs> thrown you in the deep end. One of the things that we spoke about a few times, and there's been quite a few people who spoke about it in the fitness industry as well, is fat shaming and i think it's prevalence within fitness has been much discussed especially over the past past year as well and i'm guessing from your point of view there's i mean you see stories and i've seen quite a few videos on tiktok where people come out and spoke about stuff and instagram videos where they feel like they've been fat shamed by the the gp because from your point of view it must be quite uh you must have to choose your words quite wisely and, and carefully depending on who you're communicating with because some people are going to be more sensitive to, to, to certain language than other people. So how, how do you kind of work that out when you're when you're working with a patient and, and, and choose the way that you're going to sort of present certain information or facts or advice to them? So it's, it's almost difficult to, to kind of explain it totally because I think it's it varies quite a lot between different people and between different types of people. So the key thing when communicating with anybody is, is trying to communicate with them on a level that they feel comfortable communicating at. Um, and there's lots of ways that we try and do that in a general practice consultation. And I know like before I did general practice, before I trained to become a GP, I would sit in like as a medical student and even after that with with GPs and watch them consult and I would think well it's just a chat in it they're just having a chat with people it's just all all sort of seems quite straightforward they're asking them questions they're answering them questions they're coming to a conclusion and giving them a prescription or doing a referral or whatever and then sending them on their way Um, but as I went through my training and went through kind of the communication skills training and stuff like that there's a lot more to it than that there's a lot of depth to it there's a lot of depth to trying to pick up on you know people's non-verbal cues body language little things that they might drop into sentences that might give you an idea of what they might actually be struggling with that they might not be openly talking about all of those sorts of of different things and there's a lot that's kind of going going on in in that conversation and um i guess like one of the biggest problems and one of probably the biggest criticisms from that perspective when it comes to GPs is you go to see your GP about something like an ingrown toenail or something completely unrelated to your lifestyle, unrelated to, um, you know, any any other decisions. And the fact that you are um, overweight means that that GP then goes, oh, you, you know, have you starts talking about weight loss before they've even talked about the problem that you've come in with. 
And there's a lot of different facets to that. There's a lot of different um, aspects. Like so part of the thing in, in medical school that we're trained is to pick up on um, opportunistic health promotion. So if somebody's come in for a different problem, but you think that they might benefit from some health advice, like for example, if you know they might be a smoker, um, you might still bring up smoking. So on the surface of it, these are you know, things that you might bring up. The problem has come, and, and this is what I think people have realised over time, is that it's not really a very um thorough or um inclusive way of doing it so for example you end up stigmatizing people on both sides so for example if somebody who's overweight comes and sees the gp and they get weight advice that's based on something that the gp has seen their weight which doesn't necessarily represent their health behaviors for example whereas somebody who is of a um smaller size might be having problems with drugs or alcohol or smoking or all of those other things that they might not be getting help with because the GP hasn't noticed mm-hmm. this thing that is happening. So it kind of it causes kind of, um, I suppose, like, you know, a negative effect on, on both sides. If we're looking at people's weight and making judgments on that, then we're not necessarily actually getting to the root of what the problem is because somebody might be overweight, but they might be leading a really fit and active lifestyle Mm. they might be eating really well they might have been significantly more overweight three months or six months ago and by making judgments on what you're just seeing as an appearance leads to stigma and leads to like a poor outcome basically so interest on that one yeah i I think that this is the thing is that that (coughs) by definition i think that we are like humans are people who make quick judgments and who use stereotypes to inform decisions because that's just kind of that's parts of human nature I think and I think that part of that is inherent in in sort of medicine and stuff as well because you've got 10 minutes to make all of these decisions for somebody and try and help them as much as you can like so it's well-meaning it's not kind of people aren't sort of saying that that they're not making a negative judgment about that person, but they're seeing something that might be a problem and wanting to try and help to fix it. It's really complicated. And it depends how engaged a person is in, in discussing it. Um, generally, what I what I tend to do, if, if somebody comes in with a problem that I think might be lifestyle related, I might just ask them the question, do you think there's anything about your lifestyle um, that you might be able to change that you think might make you feel better? Mm-hmm. Because I think that's quite an open question. And then, you know, I think that that part of the a lot of the criticism is that fat people don't need to be told that they're fat. They know already mm-hmm. um, they don't need a doctor to tell them that and they don't need a doctor. They generally don't need a doctor to tell them that they need to lose weight um, because they're probably already thinking that far more than the doctor even would be. So um, I think that it is something that, that needs a lot of work. And there's a lot of um, a lot of criticism has happened from about people missing like missing important diagnoses because they focused on someone's weight instead. So somebody might come in with back pain or abdominal symptoms or something and the doctor might see somebody as being overweight and think that their symptoms are down to them being overweight and so will suggest that they lose weight to deal with their symptoms, which they might then do, but then they, you might then unmask an actual underlying serious diagnosis, which is really sad You know, if people aren't, if people aren't getting the correct diagnosis because of that. As human beings, though, it's difficult, isn't it? Because first impressions, we all have them. It's very difficult not to make those assumptions straight away whenever we see people. I saw, a co- I'm going to absolutely butcher his name here now. <laughs> I'm sure you're probably following on Instagram as well. I think his name's like Dr. Idunaski or something. He's got a weird name. He works with Mike Isatel and stuff. Oh, on. Spencer Nadolski. That's the one. Yeah. I think he put something on a story and it was kind of, what are your impressions of this person? And this guy who was quite overweight and a lot of people suggested that he was lazy lethargic in their sort of statements and then he posted it again i think another 12 hours and he put the two progress pictures side by side of when he was like an extra 100 pound heavier and asked again what do you think of this person now and he'd, he'd already lost 100 pounds and everyone's then description was a lot different because they'd got the background of his story and what he'd already been through and that's why it's difficult because you see some of those people who are potentially all or are still classified as obese, but they are on a journey at the moment where they're mm. still they still work on it, which is which is difficult. But we we have those immediate assumptions of 100%. people, yeah. and it's hard not to make those when you yeah. 
when you first see people, I suppose. The other thing, interesting thing, and this is an, a topic that a lot of people spoke about on social media, is that sort of question between being fat but fit. Mm-hmm. Where is your standpoint on that? So there was actually, I think, a study that was, was spoken about recently in the media, which um, kind of said, no, you can't be. I, th- I think that the difficulty is you can... You, <laughs> Somebody who is of a larger size can be fitter and healthier than somebody who is of a smaller size, 100%. But the one the one sentence that you can never get away from, and this is something that um, Sophie Medlin, dietitian, came up with on our podcast, and I, I just love this quote because it just describes it really accurately, is that obesity is not a benign condition. You cannot have obesity with no risks. Mm-hmm. But we make other risks in our lives. You cannot go skiing with no risks. You cannot go swimming with no risks. Like there are risks in everything that we do. And there are risks in a lot of our behaviours and a lot of our lifestyles. Um, But being aware of and understanding those risks are are super important. So you can find people who are metabolically healthy, who are obese, 100%. But will they still be in five years' time? That's a different question completely. Um, And I think there's a lot of evidence that suggests that's less likely to be the case than somebody who isn't obese. Then you want to marry that up with weight loss itself as an intervention. And lifestyle changes specifically for weight loss don't have a great outcome when, you know, when weight loss is, is the goal. Because what ends up happening when people are aiming at weight, when people think that being a lower weight is healthy and being a higher weight is unhealthy like and it's just categorical they then will engage in unhealthy practices in order to lose weight which will then make the weight loss itself unhealthy and we're you know talking about things like detox teas and Mm -hmm. excessively restrictive diets that affect people's relationships with food stuff that affects their social life there's so many facets to health that like actually before you are even ask that question you've got to ask the question what what is health and health is such a multifactorial thing that affects that is affected by so many different things that it's difficult to say someone is healthier than another person you know and somebody who is of a lower weight can still get things like cancers and stuff like that as well so yeah and how do you define health and what is how do you aim for health you just try and optimize your lifestyle as best you possibly can right and so actually it's arbitrary to even decide whether one thing is healthier than other you than another you just want to try and do as much that promotes health in you as you possibly can and stop arguing about it. I think I think that's kind of part of the problem is there's, what's the point in arguing whether it's healthy to be overweight? Because actually, if, if that if that person who is overweight is engaging in as many health behaviors as possible, then great that that's that's as healthy as they're able to be within the constraints of their lifestyle, potentially. And it depends what you mean by possible, I suppose, as well. But equally, um, if they do engage in all those health behaviours, it's quite likely that they probably will end up losing a significant amount of weight. Because if you if, if you engage in all the health behaviours that we recognise are healthy, which is eating a decent diet, which is nutritionally effective and also energy balanced while doing plenty of physical activity and all of that kind of stuff... You're, you're probably going to end up you might not you know that people will be different levels of of weight for sure but you're unlikely to um have severe weight problems if you're doing those things some some people believe that and this is where the fat shaming saga comes from that by making people feel ashamed about their weight or their eating habits that's gonna it's gonna it's gonna make them be, be healthier and I, I think that's what some people's assumptions is by attacking people or discriminating people and i mean you you even see personal trainers do it as well and it's it's literally just shutting down their target audience which i think is they just don't fully understand it's like shouting to a smackhead down the road or someone who's a heroin user like leave it alone you smackhead and just Mm. shouting those kind of insults to people isn't gonna stop years of abuse whether that be with drugs or with food or whatever whatever it may be that person's still gonna struggle to lose weight and we know that by being abusive or discriminating against people just makes people uh, more stressed, makes their self-confidence even lower, makes their, their, their self-esteem even lower. And 
their their chance of staying motivated or adhering to something even lower. So, although those mo- their motives may be to try and, I suppose, motivate that that person to to lose weight, it actually does the complete opposite to that. Hundred percent. And there's there's been studies that show that which are pulled up here. Like there's a study of ninety three women, um, who had exposure to weight stigmatized and information made to those who were overweight, um, but not. Uh, but not normal weight, and they eat more calories mm-hmm. and feel less in control of eating when being exposed to that weight stigmatizing information as well. And then another study there was seventy three women who were overweight, and those who watched the stigmatizing videos ate three times as many calories afterward compared to those who watched the non stigmatizing videos. Yeah. So it's it's very evident that yeah, being exposed to hateful discriminate discriminates in people yeah. does does the complete opposing to yeah. what they're potentially looking to do by challenging that behavior in the wrong way yeah and this is what gets so frustrating when people say for example that you know if they point out an advert that they say is stigmatizing or they point out something that's been in the media which is stigmatizing and people react with oh i'm so fed up of people being offended by everything it's not about being offended by it it's about the fact that stigmatizing behavior is counterproductive it's doing the opposite of what you think it's doing or what you claim to want to do. And that's why that's what kind of leads people to the conclusion that actually if they're not engaged in trying to help improve this problem, then is all they care about just being fat phobic and actually just wanting to not be very nice mm-hmm. to fat people? Um, and it's a real question that's difficult to answer because you think, well, actually, if you were engaged in wanting people to improve their lifestyles, then surely you're going to research the best methods of doing that and try and implement them rather than just do what comes to you instinctively, which sort of seems to be something quite different. Do you think it kind of works in the same way as obviously there's the whole fat shaming, but also people who are like severely underweight in terms of like skinny shaming? because of like eating disorders or anorexia and things because I used to get it all the time like oh my god you're so skinny I don't know if it's like classes I think it's shaming someone I think it can work both ways just because someone isn't obese but they could be severely underweight and if someone calls them skinny it could be quite offensive if they're trying to gain weight like do you ever see that I guess probably me I don't know probably not as much are like on a level i mean we see it a lot in um <clears throat> in fitness people think that because people are putting their body out there people are allowed to comment on it and be quite nasty mm-hmm. about it then you hear a lot of stories about people you know like bodybuilders for example having really nasty comments made about them in public by people walking past them and stuff like that it's horrible and this is the thing is that it's 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 the same sort of behavior but it kind of comes from a different angle in the sense that people are expected to feel bad about their bodies if they're overweight but they're expected to feel good about their bodies if they are skinny or in good shape Mm. so therefore there's no tolerance for people who might be feeling awful about their bodies despite looking to to people on the outside as though they have achieved ideals that they might want to achieve um and it's really difficult with with that sort of side of things and and it's it's a it's like it's like the same type of problem but it's a different problem because it affects a whole different cohort of people Mm. but it is it's essentially body shaming nonetheless isn't it yeah it's it's people shaming people for their bodies and actually what we could probably learn from that is just stop saying stuff Mm. about people's bodies yeah you you don't need to it's not it's none of your business you don't need to to talk about someone's body shape at all it only affects them and that the other thing that people always say is that oh you know it, it's the, you know have you heard of the phrase concern trolling like oh I, i'm just saying this about them because i care about them oh I want yeah them to change and all of that kind of stuff there's a ways there are ways of approaching people if you you know if you think that they've got a health problem and you want to help them change it there's there's ways of doing that but i think people tell themselves that a lot of the time because they're saying stuff that is accepted by society like it's accepted to think you know if they put a a person in a larger body on the front cover of a magazine it's accepted to criticize it because people think that 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 magazine is then glorifying obesity Mm. but if someone has a picture of somebody smoking on the front of a magazine they're not necessarily criticized for glorifying smoking because it's like you know it even though that's a a significantly worse health behavior if they're holding a drink or whatever you know like no one's even going to think twice about something like that but 
having a fat person on the front of a magazine sort of seems unacceptable to people. I think it's because it's very visual, isn't it? Like you, you can't go into the street unless someone's physically smoking and, and spot a smoker, where you, whereas you can spot someone who's overweight. And people have these discussions sometimes. I've seen that a couple of times. If well, if you're really bothered about people's health, then you'd be walking around smacking cigarettes out of people's hands, which is just a fucking ridiculous, ridiculous comment, to do, comment to make. And and people talk about virtue signaling when people are, are, are looking to, I suppose, put an opinion out and be referencing health and fitness. But there's those other people who I think who are very aggressive when it comes to fat shaming, who who do not do it for any positive reasons, I suppose. It's generally just a, a way of them raising their status because they know by having a controversial opinion, it's going to pull in a gathering of followers who think the same way that they do. And we know punishment doesn't work. From from human behavior mm-hmm. and human psychology for work, uh, for years we know that human behavior, uh, punishment does not work at all. So it's never going to work when it comes to shaming, discriminating people to change their behaviors in, in health and fitness either. It's... I don't think it's something that we'll ever get away from. I think it's it, it's horrible to say, but I don't think... I think there's always going to be people who think that's the right way to go about it. And it makes it very difficult for even those people who potentially want to go and change their, those behaviours because the place that they need to do it is the place that they're then ashamed or scared of going to, i.e. going to a gym, which can be very intimidating in itself. And to, to pull pe- someone's self-esteem and self-confidence even lower, it's just, again doing a complete opposing to what that person challenging that behavior potentially wants them to do yeah it's re- and change is really really hard so if you get yourself into a situation where um you want to change and just for the like for the benefit of people listening so i i used to be very overweight and very inactive and i got into kind of fitness and exercise and lost loads of weight and changed my lifestyle and it was a huge like an over an overhaul like total overwhelming change of everything that happened over the course of quite a long period of time um but some of the things that happened along the way like i i can't explain how demoralizing it is to get yourself to the stage where you think you know it's been i i was i was going to a gym for i think nearly yeah three years before i was confident enough to get a personal trainer because i just didn't want anyone to i didn't want to speak to a personal trainer i didn't want them to judge me or know what I was doing etc and it was only after I'd lost I'd lost a significant amount of weight by then um, and actually when I um, when I went and started working with a personal trainer I didn't even tell him really about how much weight I'd lost because I sort of wanted I just wanted to kind of start with a clean slate I wanted yeah. to make more progress I didn't want him to kind of see me at the end of my journey and be like a you know there there you've done really well kind yeah. of situation I just wanted to just to to train and to learn to learn about strength training and stuff like that um and it was interesting because like some of the stuff that that people said along the way like when you've made this idea that you want to do something that's really really difficult and you feel like everything's against you so you definitely you're so close to not bothering to do it and then you just decide to do it and someone says the wrong thing it can just flip you immediately back down to the situation going well i'm I just i just just not going to bother it's basic human psychology it's not you know and it, w- you can override it and i was lucky enough that i did override it on many 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 occasions because i remembered why i was doing what i wanted to do and i remembered what i wanted to do and i had confidence in the fact that i could achieve it like luckily and by that point but it was interesting there was there was a time when um i was working with a coach and I had been away for the weekend and I'd been up to visit like old uni friends and we'd been out for some amazing food. Um, and we'd had I'd had this pudding, which was like a deep fried banana and Nutella sandwich. That sounds sensational. With um, blue banana ice cream and oh, candy floss. Like, wow. yeah, it, it was amazing. It was one of the best food experiences I think I've ever had. It's not something you're going to have frequently but it's something that I think you know is cool to try and he like I came back for a training session and he was like oh how was your weekend I was like oh it was amazing I went to I went away for this weekend like you've got to see what I had um this is unbelievable I showed him a picture of this of this thing like expecting him to go wow that's amazing and I just forgot what situation we were in and who he was as a person and what his values were and what he thought about 
the world and nutrition and exercise and stuff and he was horrified and he was just like I can't believe that that you would do something like that and he would like I just got a proper dressing down like in the middle of the gym that was like I think his exact words were um you cannot behave like that and expect to get results <laughs> and I just like luckily I was at a point in my life where I just went yeah I can fuck off mate. yeah <laughs> and I, that's just like yeah. inappropriate from a personal yeah. trainer to do that I think he was or she was on a complete another yeah, level exactly 100%. And, and yeah maybe for some people i mean some i just don't think that's an appropriate no. way to anything because you're not no. creating balance no. you're not doing anything so yeah, that's exactly. really good but that you were luckily at that mindset because yeah. that could have really torn you yeah, down exactly and probably tarnished your relationship with food and your beautiful blue banana <laughs> nutella exactly. situation yeah. but i think that's really inappropriate for personal trainers wh- when they say you can't do this, you can't do that, because that's going in the opposite direction of what we want yeah. to promote, which yeah. is balance. Well, for, unfortunately, that still happens, though, because Cal was actually mentioning the other week about one of his friends who had the coach. I'm not going to mention his name. Like, but he saw <laughs> one of his clients. <laughs> like he, he follows a lot of his clients on on social media. He's going for a limp ball. I'm going for a limp ball, guys. I have a limp ball. He's following one of his clients on social media. Here's those personal trainers, by the way, just talking into... <laughs> A few limp balls. Oh, wow. It's good, isn't it? I'm just going to go for the whole thing. Cheers. Oh, oh hello. I'm going to do it too. Mm. Are you about to ask me a question? I'll wait till you've asked it. I'm going to give a story. Oh, my goodness. I'd say like chocolate brownie. Yeah, double chocolate. Yeah, it, it does, actually. Yeah. Very, mm. very um, uh, oh, well, it's actually quite sickly. I'm mm. quite sickly, Lint. That's a good it? thing about limp, though, because you don't have to have a lot of them. That's why you need the bar. Mm. Mm. Wow. Okay. Anyway, there's this personal trainer who had clients and he was following him on social media. And I think if I'm telling the story correctly, he saw one of his clients out drinking and messaged him about if you want to get results, you've got to be all in. You can't be out drinking and even like what are you doing? Have it like out boozing and stuff like this has been part of the program, blah blah blah. He had a slimline gin and tonic. Yeah, the slimline gin and tonic. I would so, block my own personal yeah, trainer. I, I, <laughs> yeah, I would have blocked him and said, mate, what are you talking about? Have a day off. Mm. Yeah. yeah, have your day yeah. off. Why are you even watching me on the night out, you freak? Mm. Like, just leave me alone. Mm. And it, this is the problem because then that, that sort of... Oh, gosh, that was quite sickly. Wasn't it? <laughs> that sort of behaviour is coming from people who you'd expect to know better. And then that's that, that's all they know. They trust that personal trainer. That he's in a position of authority and he's telling them that. Yeah. And that, that behaviour is being passed down, unfortunately. Yeah. It it still happens, and I yeah I, I think it's got better because I, and I think I don't know if it's got better or, or if we just spend a lot of time in a, like our echo chamber. Yeah, the people that we associate with in fitness are very much about a balanced lifestyle and enjoying what you love as well. And I think that we're really lucky to have that. But stories like that tell us that these things do still go on, which is why it's so important that we still talk about it. And like a few years ago, not many people realised that at all. I think you know I think that that we I think. I think strides have been made and I think improvements have been made but I think it's always it's always a real risk because there's a lot of like a sort of health elitism like people kind of thinking that you know because they lead a healthy lifestyle or they do fitness or whatever that it somehow like it somehow elevates you and I think it, it's it's in us all to an extent like it's that whole hustle grind sort of lifestyle like everyone wants to feel like they're working harder than other people or like doing more or achieving more or whatever and I think that that kind of channels its way into fitness as well like that's why a lot of people like the hardcore the more hardcore the lifestyle is the more it often appeals to people because they want to feel like they are a cut above everybody else they want to feel like they're yeah, you know, going to war or in the trenches yeah. and stuff like that. Like, it is it's an interesting kind of mentality. I think. I think I've been there before, though. I feel like me too. One, when well, you as a personal trainer, no, or? just in just in life, when you're doing something, you're like balls to the wall. You're working hard. You're getting achievements, and you feel I feel fucking great. Mm. And Jordan Peterson spoke about this before, about the high that we get from it, but then the high on the opposing side of when we achieve something with other people or as pa- as part of a team that that f- sort of euphoria or that feeling is enhanced massively because you're doing it with other people mm. so for example this event that we're doing at the end of the month i think will be for me one of the one of the almost pinnacles of not just this year but of 
my and our coaching career because we get to sp- we get to spend the day with two hundred odd people for a charity that's very close to our heart with all members of the micro school who've all been part of it for a very long time, and we get to run with them all and do like the ten k at the end of the challenge. Like for me, that would just I'll probably be quite emotional when we have to do the day because doing that with with other people, like I love I love running on my own, mm-hmm. but getting it to do it with all those people in that community is just will be just such a a kind of momentous day. I think doing something for a charity that's like very very close to us is also quite fulfilling mm-hmm. because you can actually give back to someone like my nan's going to be there and yeah. stuff. She's got her deck chair ready, <laughs> and it's oh. like. But it is something really close to home, which just for those who are listening who don't know, it's for breast cancer now. And we know how many people it affects now. So I think, is it one in three or something like that? But if we have over 250 people going, Mm -hmm. there's going to be a lot of people and relatives. One way to think about it, yeah. yeah, Yeah. Who may not have been directly affected, but somebody they know or family. I don't know if it is one in three, don't quote me on that, but I know it is significantly higher now with breast cancer in general. both my neighbours, ne- both next doors, have both died from breast cancer. Really? Just scary, yeah. It's yeah. it it it's so strange the amount. I suppose especially like you, as you come into adult life, the amount of people that like you actually know or hear about who have it. But just flipping the switch back to what we were talking about before, it's we're we're all susceptible to going down those rabbit holes where we get into those habits of behaviours where we initially went in to live a happier and healthier lifestyle and we get caught up mm-hmm. with really poor choices mm-hmm. and w- me and you were having a conversation yesterday mike i wanted to bring it back up when we were watching the bodybuilding show and how last week we went to the cinema and it was probably only two or three years ago i'd go to the cinema and i'd be so restrictive I, i'm like no i'm not having anything to eat i'm not having any popcorn i don't have any sweets almost spoil the experience and then probably get home and just eat a load of shit anyway and it's i think i was i was sitting watching james bond Brilliant film, by the way. If you haven't been seeing it, I won't give it away. What was that? Is that the theme tune? How did you not know what I was doing I was then? Um, but I was sitting there thinking, in 30 years' time, am I going to sit back and think, when I went to watch that new Bond film, I'm, I'm made up that I didn't buy a box of pick and mix, pick and mix because I felt leaner the next day? No. I'm going to be sitting there thinking, did I kind of ruin that social experience by not enjoying myself fully but so i want to ask you a counter question though as well because i i think that there's balance to be found in Mm. this and i think sometimes we swing we swing in in either direction in 30 years time are you going to look back on that event and remember the pick and mix you ate at the cinema that day for me probably and that depends on it that depends on (laughs) (laughs) no but i think that depends on i think that depends on the individual as well though and and what i mean by this obviously every time you go to the cinema your experience isn't justified yeah. by having pick and mix. We hadn't been to cinema for two years because exactly. of COVID. Exactly. It, was, it was the new Bond movie that was supposed to come out two years yeah. ago. It was a bit of an experience. It was a live orchestra. I was like, let's have a good evening and enjoy 100%. it. Rather. And than- I'm all on that. And I, I think that what is sometimes hard to find the balance with is like, so for example, I, I've been in situations where like there's balance to be found even out of balance. So... If you're someone who, for example, goes out four, five, six times a week, it's okay to make like healthier choices on some mm-hmm. of those menus on some of the nights. Like maybe you can still limit it to some degree without like giving it up entirely. For example, like so for example, if you go out for dinner three or four times a week and you go out to the cinema, it's okay to go, actually, I really value pick and mix, so I'm gonna make a healthier choice on one or two of the times I'm going to go out for dinner or um, if you don't if you're not that bothered by pick and mix I think the problem comes when people who actually don't really care about pick and mix just do it because they're going to the cinema and get like a bucket of popcorn and just eat their way through it because it's just what they do they're not gaining actual enjoyment out of it and I think that's the key is figuring out what what those things what things are valuable to Mm -hmm. you and what what you actually enjoy and what you're just doing mindlessly I guess Um, and I think that that like restriction is different for everybody yeah for some people it's incredibly restrictive to go to the cinema and not have snacks for some people it's actually just not because they're not that bothered by the cinema type of snacks and then i think sometimes what you get a lot of in kind of more of a like anti-diet culture kind of discussion is that oh no don't you know you you can't not have that that's restricting yourself 
but actually it might not be restrictive for that person. Like an example I always give of this is Emma Story Gordon. She loves not eating carbs. She's not fast by carbs. So for her, if she doesn't have carbs, it's not, I'm not going to look at her and go, hmm, you, like that's really sad that you mm-hmm. didn't get to enjoy that meal, for example, because she did enjoy the meal. Yeah, She enjoyed it as much as I enjoyed mine with the carbs. It's just different strokes for different folks. I think like that's yeah, so important to remember. Yeah, I mean, it goes on to that saying, doesn't no, it? No, but also remember, I that's such a good example. Like, I bought pick and mix because I absolutely love it. But I also took in a kombucha, a ginger shot and a chicken sandwich. <laughs> Balance, bro. No, nice. no, because that's, I was like, oh, I don't like popcorn. I don't yeah. really like yeah. the hot dogs. I love pick and mix. So I'll get yeah. a bit of that, but I'm going to take in my like my own dinner. Yeah. It's a late movie, it's, so. Yeah, it's that, it's that same thing for, like, for, for some people saying yes to the piece of pizza is a big thing, but then equally... Mm-hmm. For some people saying no Say to that no. piece of pizza yeah. is a is a big thing as well. I'm not carbs front, like sometimes I'm quite aggressive when I answer story questions and I spoke about like people who were looking at a no carb diet the other day and I said like it's basically the cunt diet. I'm being <laughs> mega aggressive when I say that because I just want to dispel the myth that for a lot yeah. of people they need to be having zero carbs. I mean, for obviously Emma, she massively understands that her body and what she's doing and what she enjoys. Some people just generally cut out because they think this is how I lose weight, mm-hmm. not because this is what I enjoy doing. Yeah. And that's the the difference sometimes of when we're when I'm sometimes, I suppose, being aggressive by pushing some of those things. But we all do that because we all think that everyone's preferences mm. are the same as ours. And we've just from that chocolate discussion that we had at the beginning of this conversation, like every everything that people think about food is just totally different. Yeah, 100%. Okay, want to flip it on a head a little bit. We've talked about how potentially sometimes you have to dial, not dial down, so it's probably not the right word, but in a... GP setting, how you have to sometimes be careful, I suppose, how you're communicating with certain individuals. Do you think the political correctness is sometimes a hindrance, for example, in for some like your position and potentially how much that, that movement has grown? Just before we dive into it, I just want to give people a definition of political correctness in case they're not aware of it. So it's the avoidance of forms of expression or action that are perceived to exclude marginalize or insult groups of people who are socially disadvantaged or discriminated against i mean that sounds like quite a cool thing isn't it trying not to upset people but i love not upsetting people it's my favorite Mm -hmm. my least favorite is upsetting people so like to me i'm quite happy with political correctness i think that sometimes um it's perhaps overemphasized like for the sake of itself and for the sake of virtue signaling rather than for the sake of actually not upsetting people. I I think it's, I think it's more, I think in, there are situations where like intentions and actions are important, but there are some situations where I think actions are overemphasized as intentions. And I think it's, it's a shame that sometimes people are judged on like perhaps poorly thought out actions or actions that they didn't realize were wrong when they genuinely had good intentions. That makes me sad for Mm -hmm. people sometimes. Um, But like as a GP, I think it's especially important to be inclusive. It's especially important that anybody who comes to see you feels like they're not being judged or marginalized by any of their characteristics and that they can talk about anything that they want to talk about, even if they are engaging in behavior that people might think is wrong, for example, because it's, you need an honest discussion because without that honest discussion, you can't always help people. So I think it's extra important to to remain like completely um, neutral about a lot of things. And that's what makes it sometimes I struggle a little bit on social media with being opinionated. I'm often criticized like for sitting on the fence, Mm -hmm. but it's not like I'm not sitting on the fence because I don't want to offend people, although I don't want to offend people. I'm sitting on the fence because I like to look at both sides of an argument. And actually, in a lot of situations, there are two engaging sides to arguments Mm -hmm. and actually there isn't always a right or a wrong answer. Sometimes the answer lies somewhere in the middle. And like you mentioned before, on social media, it tends to be extremes that gain the most attention. So no, I'm not going to agree with that extreme, but I'm not going to disagree with that extreme by agreeing with the other extreme. That's not how my mind works. And I don't think that's how adult life experience works. I think you recognize that people think a certain way because they've been you know, shaped by things that have happened to them. And it's understandable that they feel that way. And we've seen a lot of a lot of this with COVID, a lot of people feeling a certain way 
about, uh, you know, the government, the medical profession, all sorts of scientific related stuff. And they feel that way because of certain circumstances and certain things that have shaped their thoughts. And that is understandable. It doesn't mean that they're right. It just means that you can understand why they feel that way. And you can use that understanding to try and help them understand another point of view. Mm. But again, like with not shaming people into changing their behavior, you're not going to get through to people by just blindly disagreeing with them and telling them the opposite extreme to them is true and by calling them rude names. It just, mm. it doesn't really work. I'd rather have an adult discussion with people. And if they don't, if they're not ready to engage in that, then they're just not ready to engage in that. No amount of beating them around the head with it is going to, is going to make a difference, I don't think. So mm. it's just, it's better not to engage in it, I think. Do you I think, don't know if that actually answers your question. But that's do, or do you think that your position though potentially makes you sit more on the fence sometimes because you're very much dealing with members of the public on a day-to-day -day basis. Yeah. You're a GP. It's kind of, I suppose, in some ways, I guess, being, being grained to, yeah. to shape your be mindset to be that way. For sure, because you're meeting all kinds of different people from all kinds of different backgrounds and they're coming and explaining to you what their problems are and you actually develop an understanding as to why those problems exist. And when you offer your ideal world solutions that you might hear the newspapers offer, they go, but I can't do that because of this. And then you go, oh, no, actually, yeah, you can't. It's the same with the with the whole lifestyle change thing. It's very easy for like a 21 year old personal trainer to be telling everyone that they should they should make time for the gym because yeah. everyone's got the same 24 hours in a day and all of that kind of stuff. But in reality, people don't have the same 24 yeah. hours in a day because they have different responsibilities to one another for vastly differing reasons. So this is the thing you you don't necessarily expect that 21 year old personal trainer with zero life experience to be able to understand that so when you've had a bit of life experience and life experience for me is is at, at work is meeting these different people you then understand it so you can approach it with a slightly different viewpoint mm -hmm. i suppose yeah i mean i want i want discrimination obviously to stop i think anyone with a decent head on the shoulders would, would want the same yeah. for me I'm, I'm obviously all for that but I don't think PC works, and I think sometimes like conformity to it just creates more intolerance. But I think it depends what it's about, though. It <laughs> depends. It depends whether it's just conformance for the sake of it, and like a tick box exercise. Like there's a lot of corporate political correctness, yeah. which I think is pointless because it's not educating people as to why it's important to do this, that, or the other, or understand this, that, or the other. It's literally, our company policy is now that you will do this. Yeah. And actually, that's not changing their behavior. It's just changing their, it's changing their actions. It's not changing their intentions. It's not making mm -hmm. them understand it. Um, and in some ways, it has value. But I think, I think any action that is done as a box ticking exercise, rather than as a genuine belief that things need to change, isn't going to achieve great change. I just I don't I think it gets a lot of weight sometimes for maybe progress that we've made in society or even over how many years and don't think it's just due to political correctness and I think it I think some obviously there's there's extremes of everything that gets pushed too far by the left sometimes and that's why we need uh, a weighted balanced argument I suppose from from both sides to, so that we don't get too much of it. Mm -hmm. The the reason why I want to bring it up is guess because there must be a lot of tick boxes that you I suppose have to abide by when looking at political correctness when communicating with patients um i don't know that there is you know do, do you know what, why i'm saying this because i suppose the language and terminology from person to person differs on what the way that they would view some people see the description of someone being fat or obese mm. as offensive yeah. and some people have even argued for the word obesity to be almost abolished yeah so when you're communicating with what well, again everyone's so different like would you call a patient overweight um i don't think i would need to call them overweight because we're not i would use the language that like i, I would try and use the language that they would so use. mirror them yeah yeah so i so like i said if i would ask a patient where that you know if um if there's anything that they think that they can can do in their lifestyle that might make them feel better if they say i know i'm fat and i need to lose weight then that's what they're talking about but i don't need to i don't need to say you are fat and you need to lose weight or yeah. you are overweight and you need to lose weight i might say um you know i might say your bmi is higher okay <clears throat> you know i might say i might use sort of stuff like that it doesn't it doesn't really matter how i say it though i think that's the point 
sorry, no, I should rephrase that. It might matter to them how I say it. It doesn't matter to me how I say it. So I'm more than happy to say it in a way that is going to make them feel more comfortable. I'm not going to, to weigh in and use aggressive language with it because it's not my nature or, or my style to do that anyway. Um, I'm going to try and approach it sensitively. But if I approach it sensitively and someone is offended by a word I use that is not really, you know, generally considered as offensive, then I'm happy to apologise and use a different word. Mm -hmm. Like, it, it's no skin off my nose to, to, to try and approach it differently. Um, and I think, I do think sometimes we get caught up on you know, our own right to express ourselves in the way that we want to, when actually in that situation, what, like, what benefit is it of me to, to, to call it those different levels of terminology? But what we've got to remember in that situation is I am in a patient-centered situation. I'm the professional in that situation, yeah. which means I'm the person in that room that needs to change my behavior to accommodate the behavior of the other person mm -hmm. in the room. It doesn't work the other way around. If they want to, if they want to say those words, they can. Now, if they were to use words that I find particularly offensive myself, I might also ask them to stop. I'm unlikely to in reality, <clears throat> but um, but yeah, I I don't know. I I think it's a different situation. Like because you, because it's a because it's that professional situation, and you're in it's it's a doctor patient situation. There's there's nothing to be gained for me by by like using terminology that some because again if that person finds that terminology offensive and thinks that I'm stigmatizing or shaming them then I'm not going to be able to help them so I need to do everything that I can to ensure that they don't think that mm. and I've, I've I'm not going to lie I have I will have got that wrong in the past I will have had complaints made by my manner and all of those sorts of things because that's what we do like we're all human beings we all say things in ways that might be interpreted in not how we meant them. We might be busy or stressed or be rushed or be trying to get through stuff faster than people might realise. And it might come across in a different way. And also pe when people come into a GP consultation, they're by definition generally quite worried, a bit nervous, probably a bit sensitive as well. So they can interpret things in ways where they're not meant. And that's, that's an understandable yeah. part of the patient-doctor interaction and something that is is my job to be mindful of and it's hard because when people go to you, you you're literally <coughs> god to them of the of their kind of solution or the, the medical world i think i, I don't, don't think that's <laughs> i think that's how <laughs> I, I feel i go in i look up i'm like you're you're pretty much my savior but i'm, I'm sure it was you spoke about this before or you may have spoke about someone else who'd comment on it but people who people basically choose to be offended uh, I don't think I've ever commented on that because that's, that's that may not have been you. That's phraseology that I don't. I don't. I don't like you like, can you can choose to be offended or not offended by what someone said. I mean, I don't. Yeah, I don't pretend I, to. I don't really agree with that. I don't really agree with it because I th I think although you could argue that that it is a choice in some ways, is it actually a choice or is it an outcome that's based on your experiences? So but you could you could say something to me right now. And it could just offend me like that, and like my emotions just immediately get to my back up. I feel offended by it. I wouldn't say I've chosen to feel that way. It's just by brain. Yeah. yeah, and if if for example, like uh, you know, if you've grown up being called like a nasty name at school, for example, and then you've sort of got past that, and you've grown up, and you're in a society where people don't tend to call people nasty names, and then someone calls you that name that brings back those memories of how you felt. It's how people's words are really, really powerful and words can make you feel a certain way. And I might have control over how things make me feel. I might be able to control it, but that doesn't mean that I am going to control it. And it doesn't mean I'm going to control it in every situation. So I might work with a therapist or I might do mindfulness techniques or whatever to decide that I am going to respond to certain situations in a different way. But not everyone will have done that. Mm -hmm. Some people just react on an emotional level. And if you hit like words have the power to hit people's emotions. We know that. Yeah. We know that if you, you know, if, if people do certain things, there will always be things that that trigger people. You know, something that, that really annoys me that no one would ever think would, would really annoy me. If I post a picture of food on my Instagram story, someone responds with a like a vomit emoji. <laughs> oh my God. It really gets to me. Really? And I to the point where I can't, I can't even say it 
get, I've just said it on a podcast <sighs> now, but I never say it because I think I know it's really unreasonable and I know I will just look like I'm being really passive aggressive, but it just really, it really annoys me for some reason. Cause I'm like, don't make a vomit face. But when it's something that you feet, like, I love <laughs> yeah. my feet. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but when it's something Stop that you, it. you like and enjoy in your life and someone has an opinion, like, it, it's kind of going to touch a bit of a nerve sometimes, no matter what it is, whether it's food that you've made or whether it's food that you've yeah. just chosen to consume. But is that me choosing to be offended or is that me reacting emotionally to a situation that I that I'm interpreting you could interpret that situation differently like I can say oh well actually that person doesn't really mean that they just think it's a funny emoji that is probably true but am I always going to be well rested and calm and relaxed to the point where I will always react like that or one time will I reply rudely to somebody who who puts that and and say don't say that about my food you know (laughs) Like you don't know, yeah. and I think I think that the idea of it being a choice is very very complex. I think it is, you know, you can argue that there are elements of it where you know if you've decided something's offensive and you just always take offence of it, just regardless of what the intentions were around it, then that's fine. But sometimes it's about education. Sometimes it's about realizing that stigmatizing things are stigmatizing because I think we don't always realize that they are until somebody points it out to us. Mm-hmm. Like I don't think I would have at the time when that personal trainer said that stuff about the food that I had, I didn't think he was stigmatizing and I wasn't offended as such. I just knew it wasn't very pleasant. It mm-hmm. made me feel it made me feel bad. I'm not going to lie. Like it made me feel bad what he said. I don't know that that like now I feel worse about it than I did then because I've learned more about how unacceptable that sort of behavior is. But at the time I was like, that's just normal PT behavior. Yeah. I suppose it depends how invested you are to that, that thing. Hmm. So if you, and it depends what your relationship is with that said thing. So for example, if, if I said to someone, oh, you shouldn't do deadlifts because they're really bad for your back and blah, blah, blah. And then we had someone like, for example, Matt Does Fitness, who was on the podcast last week. He would probably, shit would hit the fan because he loves deadlifts. So if you're quite invested in that that thing yeah. and you love it, and it's part of your life that you really enjoy it or it's a hobby, then that to you is going to offend you even even more. Yeah, I, I, when people insult my music, I can't I can't handle it. I know you're on that, yeah. on that level of head so well before. It's bad times. Can we get a little, a little snippet of chocolate? Oh yeah, yeah. I've never Which taste. Oh, do you want to... Let's the go for the caramel? Caramel. Go for the orange. Yeah, what is this one? Sea salt caramel. Sea salt caramel. This okay. is, I think, one of the best of the range. Let's go for it. Also, Mike, we did a podcast last week uh, about anxiety. Mm-hmm. And I know that Lucy yeah. had a, a question that she wanted to run by a, you. I had a burning question because I know we briefly touched on this when we were at IFS together. And I think I was just talking to you about it. But, and it's hard to describe it. So it's like the different. Ooh, here yeah. it is. It's. I was trying to explain it to Ben because he woke up the other morning. He's like, I feel really anxious. I was like, it's just a feeling. I was like, you could be sad. You could feel anxious. You could feel happy. Whereas that's different to having anxiety. Oh, that looks really good. I'm going to eat it in a second. That is so good. But I just think there's a massive difference between where you have anxiety and it's a long-term thing. I've had it for about three years Mm -hmm. Like, I got diagnosed about three years ago, and mine's a long-term thing. And when some people are like, oh, I have really bad anxiety, and they just have it for a day, I'm like, "Mm, I don't know if you do have anxiety, or do you just have feelings of anxiousness? And Cal gave the description of, it's like when someone says, oh, I'm really depressed. You're not depressed for just that one moment. You're actually just feeling really, really sad. So I just need, I would be very curious to understand your input so on it part of the problem with anxiety is that it's the name of an emotion and it's the name of a medical condition Mm -hmm. and anxiety the emotion is perfectly normal it's a perfectly normal thing to experience in response to certain different situations um whereas anxiety the medical condition is you know a, a different um it's a different thing altogether and there's like the difficulty is that it's there are criteria to diagnose somebody with anxiety and it tends to be based basically on how much of an impact it has on their life. So if they are suffering from anxiety, the emotion for a disproportionate amount of time in disproportionate situations when they shouldn't be feeling it, then they may well have anxiety, the medical condition. If, you know, I I don't think there's a human on the planet who has never felt 
anxious mm. as an emotion like you know we we feel it all the time um and yeah there are certain like i say it, it's more based on how much of an impact it's having on your life into how abnormal or pathological it is and like I say, there's specific diagnostic criteria for it. But at the same time, it's quite a subjective thing. You can't give someone a blood test to check if they've got mm. anxiety. Yeah. You know, like, so for example, somebody who drinks like three cans of Monster every morning might experience anxiety every day because often like caffeine makes us feel like jittery and can make us feel a bit more anxious. I get a bit anxious when I drink too much coffee, for example. Um, so it might not even be a medical condition. It might be related to other things that they're doing, like substances and stuff like that. Alcohol is another big one when it comes to anxiety. So um, I guess that the ultimate outcome is, I think if people think that they are struggling with it, then it's important to seek help from a health professional so that they can discuss how much they're struggling with it, what it actually means, how to improve it. And like I say, you know, the even... Like the symptoms will be different for people, but also the treatments will be different for people. So sometimes people will just need a little bit of, you know, mindfulness or self help or stuff like that. Sometimes people will need therapy, like CBT, for example, and sometimes people might need medication for it. Mm. Um, it's just there's there's like this huge spectrum with lots of grey areas in it, and that's what makes it kind of difficult to delineate it. And if yeah. somebody says to you, I get really bad anxiety. That can mean a thousand different things. Yeah, it you is. Know. It's tricky. Yeah, that was interesting. Yeah, and it is. It it is. Even I think that people, because people have become more engaged in talking about their mental health, which I think is amazing. We do also run the risk slightly of pathologizing normal emotions as well. So because we say, oh, if you might be feeling like this, you might be suffering with anxiety. Yeah. yeah. So then people go, oh, my God, I'm suffering with anxiety. It makes when you actually, more anxious. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and then, then they've got, you know, they actually are just making a medical condition out of normal human emotions. But that's, yeah. that's why it's important to just get guidance from professionals who can help to try and explain it. And uh, and some people like to have an explanation for, for things. So some people want to they almost will want a diagnosis because they'll feel like then yeah. it sort of takes it out of their hands. Yeah. Um, but the outcome is often similar because it's still the same sort of work you would need to do on it, regardless of whether it's a, you know, a medical condition or just a recurrent emotion. Mm -hmm. Um, sometimes I haven't personally even to talk about it, though massively takes this thing out of it for a lot of people. I put on the story the other day. I get sometimes where you, you get that bout of mourning anxiety and it just feels almost really crushing, like hard to breathe, feel stressed over nothing. Mm -hmm. The amount of people that sometimes put on story will just talk about it and even feel relieved that I've just put up, especially guys, because I suppose we don't speak as openly about emotions sometimes and the relief that even people just go, I'm so glad that you, you've you said it or spoke about because sometimes I just get it for no reason too. Sometimes it just makes people feel a little bit better about the day as well. 100%. I think, you know... I think talking gets a bit of a bad rap because people feel like if oh we should all talk about it but what then what 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 action are we taking but actually in a lot of situations talking itself is incredibly beneficial mm -hmm. listening also incredibly beneficial um and like there is I think awareness has more of an impact than people understand or realize mm -hmm. um so yeah I think it often gets unfairly criticized the other question that I wanted to ask you, because I realise we're getting incredibly tight on time, which is, we've flown through an hour and 15 already somehow. Gosh. Is it always happens on podcasts, uh, though. It's like the little turning glass in Harry Potter when the conversation yeah. is going well, it, the sand yes. moves slowly. I like that analogy. That's that very good. Literally. Harry Potter today. analogy as well. It works yeah. for me. But we've got, we're, in some, okay. we're, in this, we're in this new bougie studio today, but we pay for like two hours, so I... Don't know if we're I feel get... like the electricity yeah, is going to drop off. <laughs> 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 and all our podcasts is just going to suddenly disappear. But um, your your thoughts on, or your opinions on GPs and fitness, nutrition, wellness advice, because I feel like some sometimes, like with any field, there's, there's a minority potentially who just give some a bad name and you sometimes hear people I've had this bit of advice on Facebook from a GP and it was blah 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 and you see all these personal trainers chipping in and it's like da, da, da. and it's it's kind of a bit a bit of a, a battlefield or a, a kind of a, a kind of a bit of a, a war wound that people just kind of pour salt on and again 
I'd like to hear your opinion on that as well. And and is there enough, I suppose you will know, help and education for GPs on in that field? Uh, the short answer is no. Um, I don't think that we are very well trained. There, there's lots of people that are trying to bring more nutrition and stuff into the curriculum and, and lifestyle related mm-hmm. things. Um, but historically, it's been something that's not been focused on massively. But so I think that the problem has come with GPs are often the last port of call for mm-hmm. people. You know, someone goes to the gym um, and wants to join up with the gym. I'll go and check with the GP. Someone goes to a pharmacist and asks a question. Go and see a GP. Someone, an advert on a TV. I'll just ask your GP. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so it's often people come to the GP expecting a problem to be solved. And it's quite difficult. I, one of the things that I find most challenging is holding my hands up and going, this is the wrong place for this. I'm not the right person to give you this advice. And part of the reason I think for that is because GPs are free at the point of purchase. And actually, if somebody wants to get general lifestyle or nutritional advice or fitness advice, they generally want to get it from someone like a personal trainer or a nutritionist or a dietitian. Um and it's difficult on like on the NHS if you don't have a medical condition that means that you warrant that advice it's quite difficult yeah. to actually get it on the NHS and a lot of people don't necessarily want to engage in sort of the private sector or paying for things and then we also know that there's lots of like dodgy people kind of in the the private sector giving dodgy mm-hmm. advice as well so it's really difficult so i think a lot of gps end up doing their best and trying to advise people on things that perhaps they think they know about like lots of people think they know about health and fitness and nutrition when they don't necessarily know as much as they think or they might have been misinformed themselves because they know this stuff from a documentary that they've Mm -hmm. watched rather than medical school because we've not been taught that in medical school um so sometimes i think it's it's kind of it's good intentions but i think often we're taught as being these jack of all trades in general practice that we're often sort of just we just expect to try and help people as best we yeah. can and sometimes it's it, it, sometimes it's better to know our limitations and I think that that's part of the reason that I you know developed doing more stuff on social media and doing talks and all of those sorts of things is because of the passion that I developed for wanting to educate people having been through a lifestyle change myself and realizing how little we know about it as as medical professionals and also as as general members of the public and thinking like I'm supposedly this really highly educated person on health and yet I've done some really ridiculous things in the name of dieting and health and fitness because I just don't know about it so if I don't know about this stuff then how can we expect everybody else to know about it and certainly how can we expect other doctors to know about it because they're not even interested in it like mm. I might be for example so I think that it it's it's a really difficult thing to um to navigate um I think we need to be better as medical professionals at understanding where our job ends and other people's jobs begin and that's hard to do because we don't always unless you know what people do it's difficult to know, you know, difficult to point people in, in the direction of other people. Um, but I would like to see it more on kind of medical school curriculums and stuff like that so that people understand a little bit more about it. And I and I think it is. I think I think stuff has changed with regards to that. I went and did some stuff um, with Bristol Medical School. They had like a lifestyle day and they got um, the medical students to like bring in what they thought was a healthy lunch that they had to make themselves that's and an like, interesting idea no it was incredible and they the stuff some of the stuff that they had brought in and like people had like baked their own bread and you know made like sandwiches and that they'd like of all this stuff that they'd done from scratch and i was like i couldn't even make dolmio stir and sauce <laughs> when i was a student so i was pretty impressed by yeah. the stuff that they knew I about s- nutrition so i suppose that as an experiment that was quite difficult in, in itself because there's i suppose like as an experiment it how like what's the validity of it because people are doing stuff probably like oh this is what i'm expected to bring in oh for sure probably quite difficult isn't it but i just mean even the fact that they had the capability of like making their own yeah, bagels yeah. and yeah. stuff like that i was like <laughs> yeah <laughs> making yeah. some sourdough but bread you, know, you can make thing. your own bagels i say it all the time when people ask me some questions on instagram story or, or dms i don't know mm. because i'd rather say i don't know and potentially help food yeah point them in the right direction rather than me giving them advice which i also feel like there's a lot of pressure for personal trainers 
to give advice on injuries or mobility that they have no idea about yeah. and they get in the good. And I think the biggest one that, that is out there at the moment, and I've spoke about this, is with eating disorders, eating mm. disorders and giving advice with yes. that yeah. and giving okay again, probably from a coming from a place of good intentions, but with a really, really bad outcome. Mm. And then you get another some people who will benefit from it in regards to a monetary value, which uh-huh. are those people who are what are those things called in Harry Potter? The Dementors, the sucking sucking the life out of people. And I hate that. That's the thing that pisses me off a lot. And I know there's been been quite a bit of it. But from your point of view, I would guess that is harder to do to say I don't know because people would just be I don't find it hard to do. Like, I think it depends on your confidence as a practitioner. Like, I, I've kind of got to a stage where I feel like if I need to look something up, I need to look it up. If I feel like I know I don't need, I'm not supposed to know this, I'm okay with it. I think it's hard when you are, um, if you don't necessarily have a lot of confidence in your own practice or you're not very experienced, so you think that the reason you don't know it is because you should know it and you don't, so you then get embarrassed and you try and, you know, you try and, you know, muddle through it. But I'm quite happy to to hold my hands up when I don't know something. I'm, I'm You know... You know, you hear stories about uh, people's GPs Googling stuff. Yeah. I'm quite, I'm, and they, they'll do it behind, they'll sort of turn the screen and like secretly Google something. I'll happily say to a patient, I'm going to, I'm going to look this up now because yeah. I don't know, I don't know what it is because I, I kind of feel confident that, um, that I am competent at my job. So if I don't know something that that's okay. And I know that I can't, you can't know everything. It's just not possible. And it's not possible to even, even, you know, knowledge changes as well and actually there are set, there are lots of times where I haven't seen a particular medical condition for a really long time and I'll say look I'll be honest with you I know how to treat this I'm just going to look it up to just check that basically this refreshing is still, yeah, that yeah this is still what we do because I actually haven't seen someone with this problem for quite a long time and I like to think that people appreciate that sort of level of honesty and it's not you know it's not something I've ever been into to try and make to try and make myself seem cleverer than I am I like I'm just I, I don't need it um but i think it is hard for a lot of people to do that and to admit when they don't know stuff because it's a, i think it's an ego thing sometimes as well but the eating disorder thing is is i think like you say a very very big problem in fitness at the moment because it's it's probably one of the most fashionable angles at the moment yes. i can fix your eating disorder eating disorder your relationship with food etc cetera, etc cetera. and it's it's a lot of people are, are really blurring the boundaries between really highly specialized clinical treatment, which granted is quite sometimes difficult to come by, which yes. is what makes it I, It's kind of you understand why even people with good intentions will end up going down that road because they'll go, well, this person needs help. They're not being able to get it through their GP or through the local eating disorder service or whatever. I feel like I can help them, so I'm going to help them and make money in the process. And I think that's where it becomes quite difficult and where the boundaries become a bit blurred. Mm-hmm. And I think part because we also we have a, 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 a non-privatised health service, it then becomes even more blurred because mm-hmm. it's like, well, you know, it's we don't expect to, to pay for our health care in this country. So it's kind of... I don't know. It, it's really, really tricky. Is that you? You just you think that by paying for it, you're then getting a better service, whereas in reality, in some situations, you're not. Yeah, I mean, we've both been down that route of struggling with eating disorders, and it's it's a, it's a hard thing to get help with because I went to the GP and the advice was like, "Oh, what are you doing with your diet?" Obviously, got, uh, asking questions about what I was currently doing, and th- there was nothing really. I suppose that I was put a finger on that was wrong with my diet, but then getting advice from someone else on top of that mm-hmm. is not cheap when you do it privately for a, for a therapist or with CBT or whatever. And, and that's where it becomes difficult to then go, well, okay, where does this person really go if they're not going to get it funded by the NHS because they don't have the funds to be able to pay for it. But they can afford a personal trainer or an online coaching group that, that yeah. I've seen, I've seen people advertising like, eating disorder online group coaching like and it it's really really worrisome um but at the same time you like you say you can see why people fall into it and you can see that there are that i I, i'm kind of a big believer that there are not many people who go around with 
actively bad intentions like, oh, do you know what I could exploit this group of people mm -hmm. and get this amount of money from it but I think that if you're doing something that a lot of people who do have a lot of knowledge about the, the subject that you're talking about are telling you that you're, you're doing something that's really bad and you don't listen I think that's what's really bad mm -hmm. I think you can almost understand people sort of leaning towards it going down that direction but if especially in the current climate where we've got lots of people speaking out about this to listen to people speaking out about it and go nah I'm just gonna carry on that's when it when it crosses the line for me into being kind of you know a little mistake that's a bit dangerous and you should not do that again mm. to being a bit unforgivable because people are kind of almost knowingly causing harm mm. yeah and we do it with our school groups sometimes don't like we vet stuff sometimes to go through and look at the comments and you'll often see people sometimes who you can tell have struggles with eating disorders and we'll do our best to try and point them in the right direction then of people that they can get help with because a lot of people because we've suffered with it will come to us and say can you coach me on this this and this and the way i describe it to people is and the, the way that people take advantage of people sometimes is although i have passed my driving test it doesn't mean that i'm then capable of teaching someone else how to drive the two completely yeah. different things and that's why i always say categorically no mm -hmm. one I'm, I'm not qualified to do so and two i don't get paid enough to be able to do that yeah. either so i'm, I'm not going to go down those realms even though we've both both struggled with yeah, it. it's very similar and i get it so often because i always i'm riddled with injuries a lot of the time mm -hmm. just because i do so much like oh i've done that to my knee as well what did you do yeah. i see a physio every single yeah, week yeah. and you mm, should yeah. do that too yeah i like and it's got to the stage where you can't and also it's very individual i feel where it's like an eating disorder an injury they're so specific to the person you have to go and speak to someone mm -hmm. else yeah. even what i do for my knee my shoulder probably wouldn't work for you anyway yeah. so you're gonna have to go off and seek that help professionally 100%. on your own 100 percent. and there's there are people you know like i I am increasingly getting more and more sort of questions on my Q and A or private messages from people asking for sort of personalised medical stuff, which I absolutely cannot give. Like, uh, like actually, recently somebody messaged me and asked me uh, they'd been prescribed a medication by their GP, but they didn't understand the dosage instructions, and the pharmacist had told them to speak to the GP. So they were worried that they wouldn't be able to speak to the GP in time before. The GP closed, so, so they private messaged me, and there was sort of this moment where I thought, well, look, I, I, you know, I know the dosage of this drug. I could help this person by answering that question, and then I thought, but hang on a minute, I don't know anything about their medical yeah. conditions. I don't know their medical history. I don't know whether I don't know how much they weigh. I don't know whether they might need a lower dose because of their kidney function or their liver function, or a higher dose for another reason. Like there are so many opportunities to make an error which could cause harm to somebody. It's so difficult to explain that to people without just seeming mm -hmm. like you're sounding obstructive. So it is incredible. I, I, I understand why it's tempting to people to go, look, this the dose of this medication is this. Because it's quite possible that if they were they were my patient and they phoned me up, I would be able to tell them that over the phone. But I'd have their medical records mm -hmm. in front of me. And I'm also like the other side of it is I'm also... I'm being paid, it's my job to shoulder that risk. Yeah. And it's an acceptable risk. That's part of my job. Whereas somebody else is being paid to shoulder that risk for that person. It's their responsibility yeah. mm -hmm. to do that, not not some random person on Instagram. And, and you sort of, you have to remain quite boundaried with it. And I, it's really hard because again, if you if you just want to you know, be nice people. and not yeah. upset people by not answering their questions. And then you think, and then there's this moment where you go, well, actually, am I causing them harm? Because mm -hmm. then might they then potentially make up the dose themselves and yeah. then overdose? And then could that be worse than me just telling them the dose? I think you can overthink it. But actually, there are protocols and there are reasons of doing things for a reason. So you have to go by what's what what should what should be done, even if it doesn't always seem like the the most mm -hmm. ideal way of doing things because there are reasons that people have made these decisions and you know like that's why there are rules on that note should we have our last dose of chocolate can you can you, can you prescribe that i don't think i can eat anymore the sea salt i'm just really really full i, why is it I, like? I feel like we're doing digestive though isn't it see the dark chocolate sea salt is like i feel like we're doing an injustice if we don't yeah do it. isn't dark chocolate 
an appetite suppressant as well. I think There's that's what the bros say, isn't it? Is yeah, I, I used know. J- I don't J- know why I've heard Jamie that. used to have me on three three pieces of lint, eighty five percent before bed. It's got to be really high percentage though, hasn't isn't it? Isn't it like meant to? I think I part of that was to do with the sugar content, yeah. and in those ah. days, how that was thought to be bad. But I think um, also there was like, isn't isn't dark chocolate meant to be? Good for your heart. Thermogenic or something. But Fem it's not. Food. I think it's just... Well, that, that's the that thing of like people say, oh, it's good for your heart, so I might as well eat a full bar. It's the same content where my dad goes, like well, red wine. wine's good for you, so you'll drink a bottle of it. <laughs> but we're actually going for um for a lovely brunch after this. We're taking Mike to York Cafe in Birmingham. We haven't been... I'm very excited. Sensational. Sensational. Cheers. Cheers, mate. Sea salt chocolate. Mmm. Mmm. I like that. Like those was those are nicer though. Yeah, they were great. What's your ultimate review? I love the the strawberry pink one. That mm-hmm. was my favorite. Mm-hmm. Then I'd say the orange. Are they called Tonys. Yeah, orange. And then I'd say the limp balls, the new chocolate yeah. ones. And then I'd say the sea salt. What was that in order of top to bottom? Yeah, mm-hmm. I would agree. But I put that before the limp ball. Yeah, okay. yeah, I'd put sea salt. I find limp balls actually. Quite sickening. You need the I tablet. I think they're really, yeah. yeah. Because there's too I much. I can't eat the balls. Too much melty. <laughs> there's too much brownie in the middle. Too much melty in the mm. middle. Yeah. Not enough I chocolate. can't have it near me, Ben, because I'll eat I that. I 100% agree with you on that. It's not the right ratio. But, Dr. Mike, thank you very, very much for your time today. We massively Thanks appreciate having you having you on. It's been no, really great. No joke. Honestly, it. I would absolutely be honoured to have you as my GP. I think just just from you as a human being, how much you actually care for other people. And obviously I've had quite a few GPs and this is nothing against the GPs that I've had. But the people who have you as a GP are genuinely, genuinely very, very, very lucky people to have someone Stop. who cares so much and is intelligent and loves what they do as much as you do, mate. And I honestly mean that hand on heart. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. But where can people find more of you as well? If you want to tune into your socials. Uh, Dr. Mike the Second, so D R M I K E T H E two N D on all of the socials. Um, uh, I do a weekly email called the Doctor's Note, and a podcast called Fitness Unfiltered that we've got about eighty five episodes of as well with Dan Osman and Emma Story Gordon, um, and yeah, here as well. Yes, and if people want to see more chocolate reviews, they Instagram, know where to go. Instagram. Thank you very much, guys. If you enjoy this episode of the podcast, please tag me, Lucy and Mike, on stories if you're going to post it. If you are watching on the YouTube channel, hello, guys. Mike, <laughs> give people a wave. And please drop a, a review or if you've got any questions uh, that we can then ping over to Mike. I'm sure we'll be happy to answer many, any of them on the YouTube channel. And comment your five favourite chocolates because yes. I'm very curious because I feel like Ben's was really rogue. Like, I don't feel like that was a very really solid I list of five. I like could have done better. I feel like you really could have done better, but... We, we want to know what your five favourite to- chocolates are. Sorry, Ben, I just feel yours was really thrown off. Because you were sick of them. It's not the same. <laughs> and then please leave a review on Apple Podcasts. And if you watch on YouTube to know that these new episodes are going up, make sure you hit that little notification bell. It's a little and bell. subscribe. Because if you're not subscribed, then what are you doing in life? If you're not subscribed, don't bother. <laughs> yeah. You're just an absolute whopper. But see, see you next week, guys. Bye. Bye.